Welcome to Medical Office Resources of Florida. We are so glad that you are here. My name is Dorothy Mowbray. I am the media chair and board of director, um, and I also have my normal gig at Roar Internet Marketing. And I apologize, I forgot my little name tag this morning. But I wanted to um, welcome you all here and uh, so appreciate that everyone's here because, you know, more of is all about bringing all the aspects of healthcare together under one unified source. We do that through a lot of these educational presentations like we have today on physician burnout, as well as we archive all of our past presentations on the moreoff.net website. So if you ever are curious, uh, especially for those that may be new, what else we've talked about and what other presentations are there, you can go to our site. They're all archived and all available for you to access that great information there. We have a LinkedIn open group with thousands of healthcare members where there's a lot of conversations and um, other ways that you can kind of uh, uh, ask questions and promote your business and all of those sort of things as well. Um, there is a, uh, a, a number that uh, uh, I thought was kind of compelling. And any guesses as to the number of doctors that, and I know this is a really weighty subject, but the number of doctors that commit suicide every year. Now granted, there's not maybe not a direct correlation from burnout to suicide and suicide to burnout, but it's obviously a part of that whole issue and, and aspect and problem that we're going to discuss today. Any guesses on what number that is on average of physicians that commit suicide every year? Yeah, across the country. Yeah, not just in Central Florida. 2,000? A hundred? Thankfully, it's not 2,000. Unfortunately, it's more than 100. 500, it's actually 400. So that's pretty close. Yeah, 400, which is double the suicide rate of non-physicians. So that's a pretty astounding number. Um, and those are some of the, the things that our speaker today is going to talk about, um, a new look at the serious problem of physician burnout and small steps that the systems and individuals can take to build re resiliency, fight burnout, and change healthcare. The delivery of healthcare in America continues to experience it unprecedented and challenging changes. Physicians and other providers of direct care are experiencing burnout at epidemic rates, and patients are beginning to feel the repercussions of physician exhaustion and disengagement. There is new research that is calling on systems to make changes in how care is being delivered and how physicians are being measured. The recommendations are being implemented and measured and it will hopefully inform best practices. At the same time, physicians need to resources to maintain their own health while the system learns to adjust. Please join us as we discuss the system of individual resi resiliency strategies that are being considered in the research and implemented at some of our organizations. And that is all being presented today by Dr. Kathy Gibney. She is a board certified psychologist and the director of the Center of Physician Wellbeing at Florida Hospital here in Orlando. She's enjoyed redesigning and expanded direction for the previous physician support services department with a focus on prevention of burnout and building resiliency. She received her doctoral training in psychology at Northeastern University and her clinical training at BU Medical Center and the Center for Multicultural Psychology where she was a clinician and teaching fellow. Kathy's early work first uh, focused on trauma within families, specifically when someone was murdered. Since those beginnings, she has worked in a variety of clinical settings as a psychologist and clinical supervisor. Kathy has also taught psychology at the University of Notre Dame, University of Arizona, and University of New Hampshire. Her past experiences have increased her passion and appreciation for the personal and professional journeys of individuals and the stories those adventures write on people's hearts. She is dedicated to walking with physicians and administrators during this time of change in healthcare. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Kathy Gibney. Thank you. I've been asked to come up here, which feels very strange to be so high above all of you. A lot of times I like to be probably more on the ground level with the people, you know, that's like a psychology role. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here, and it is an important topic. Um, and um, as was mentioned, the suicide is, has been 
directly related in some people's minds to burnout, but really it is um, not directly related. Uh, burnout um, is not a pathological syndrome. It, is, it can be seen as a part of a spectrum, but we'll, let's talk about what it actually is as we go through this. Um, but I wanted to start with a quote, um, and that is, this is coming from um, Sir William Osler, who anybody who has been trained in medicine knows this name because he was one of the very first people who started medical school training. And what he said very early on was that the practice of medicine is an art, not a trade, a calling, not a business. A calling in which your heart will be exercised equally with your head. And what has happened is that the way that medicine has changed and what we see in the way that medicine is now delivered is that for physicians to have the head and the heart engaged becomes more and more challenging every day with the way that medicine is being delivered. So I want to start with a, a little video um, that will just, I think, set the stage for my concept a little bit about how medicine is becoming and has become. All right, girls. Now, this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. There's nothing like I Love Lucy to get a point across. Um, but I show this for two reasons. One, because for many people in medicine, this is what it feels like, that the more they do, the more they're asked to do, the faster they have to move. And as they're doing that, they are learning to shove down a lot of the things that are upsetting and confusing. And they wind up in this really distressed place. The other reason why I show is because I was happy to hear some people able to laugh, and I talked to our physicians about how important laughter can be. When we talk about resilience and building strategies, um, that is one of the things that I actually encourage them to do. And I will be at a workshop sometimes, and we will just all start laughing. And the very first time I did that, physician said to me, you cannot laugh without a joke or something. And I said, oh, no, we really can. And we can actually have a whole room start laughing. And the equivalent of 10 minutes of a really good laugh is the same as 60 minutes of mindful meditation. It's pretty important. So it's something to keep in mind for anybody who is uh, struggling with stress, and we all do. If you're alive, you've got stress. So laughter is one of those things. Let me tell you a little bit about what actually we're talking about when we talk about physician burnout. What it is um, is, is a matter of becoming exhausted, um, where you actually can rest and up and feel as though you've never gone to sleep. And then depersonalization, where you actually can separate yourself from the people that you're working with. And then the final is a lack of appreciation, a sense of a lack of appreciation for what you do, or that there's no meaning in your work. These are the three dimensions we look at. There's only one gender difference that has been found in the research in terms of burnout, and that is that women will report exhaustion first, and males will report the cynicalism, the dimension that takes them away from the patient. 
they'll, you might hear somebody say, I love my job. If we could just get rid of the patients, I'd be fine. Um, you know, then we know we've got a little bit of a problem with burnout at that point. But when we have all three dimensions, then we're talking about somebody who's really, really needing some intervention. What, what burnout can lead to uh, is what we talk about in terms of anxiety, depression, suicide. It doesn't have to lead to that. It doesn't often lead that. Um, and of course, depression, suicide, anxiety are also uh, syndromes that are completely separate from burnout um, and no relationship at all. Um, when we look at the numbers, 54, almost 55% of our physicians are now reporting symptoms of burnout. More than half of our population of medicine um, are reporting burnout. It is an epidemic stage. Um, when I first started to work in the field, you know, I, I asked some questions about why are we not looking this systemically. If we had anything else as a disease state that had this percentage or this uh, presentation of people, we'd be saying something is wrong with the system. And indeed, there is a lot wrong with our medical system. Um, people who are unsatisfied, we've gone from a 40% uh, percent dissatisfaction rate in 2012 to now a 40 um, almost 49% dissatisfaction with work life. There's very little work life balance um, in medicine for people. And then, in comparison to the population, we're way above when we talk about physicians. The ones who are most critically um, affected by this are our frontline critical care. People look at urology and say, why urology? Well, that's a long conversation, but they really are up there because their medicine and their delivery of medicine has changed so much as part of it. Um, emergency medicine, family medicine. Um, we are having a much more difficult time getting people to even be interested in to going into family medicine because of the way that it's changed in its delivery, where it used to be you know, the old days when we had very old um, you know, the movies and the TV shows where you had Marcus Welby going out with his little bag if you needed to do a house call. Well, now, most physicians, as you know, if you have a primary care physician, if we get 15 minutes with that primary care physician, we're doing really well. Most of the time, we have more like a seven or eight minute interaction with our primary care physicians. That is not what they want. It is not what they think is good medicine. Uh, however, the system, again, is, has been eroding some of that. And it's, very, it's a great struggle. So really, when we look down, everyone has some. Um, psychiatry, psychology, and mental health is at the bottom, but still 40%. And we are supposed to know how to take care of ourselves better. It's not looking good, in other words. Um, some of the things that people report that they believe cause burnout, and they're mostly related to system things if you look at it. Bureaucratic tasks, the way that they're being measured, the extended hours. I can tell you that with the ele electronic medical record, which um, we all thought was going to be a very good thing, and I still think it, it will be once we figure it out. Um, it has, for every hour of patient care in a day, so for a 60-minute time frame that a physician spends with patient, direct patient care, they will spend two hours interfacing with the computer. That's a problem, as you can imagine. So we have our physicians, what we now call pajama time. Um, in our hospital, we're able to see when our physicians are doing their notes. And our physicians are doing their notes from 9 o'clock at night until midnight. Um, the ones that they don't finish during the day. So that means they get home late, they have a little bit of time with their families, and then they're back on their computers doing what they couldn't get done during the day. It is a significant problem. What are the consequences of burnout? The research is pretty clear. There's an increase in medical errors. So our whole idea now is people are finally really beginning to understand that this is affecting patient care. If we're not taking care of our doctors, patients are going to be the ones that are going to feel this, and we need to have them understand that. Um, they're impaired professionally. We'll have more physicians who are um, using substance or are sleep deprived, which means that their ability to make good decisions is affected. Um, Patient satisfaction is affected. Uh, what's interesting with patient satisfaction is um, now our national billing system is directly linked to patient satisfaction, which is a problem. Um, not just because patients have, not because patients are complaining. That's not the problem. The problem is that when we have patients who will come into the system and be asking for for example, narcotics, and our physicians are saying no um, when it's not appropriate. Or if somebody comes in and wants antibiotics and it's not appropriate because we know how antibiotics might affect the patient, if they don't like that, they go on and they give bad patient satisfaction. 
just so you know, in the long run, that eventually will take money out of the physician's pocket, out of the healthcare system pocket, and it affects ratings across the healthcare system. So it's really complicated. Um, and we have increased them. We talked about depression, um, staff overturn. We have um, people that don't want to go into medicine now. So it is a pervasive problem. What are the, the effects on an organization? Because we're talking about not just individuals that are affected by this, but systems. And so for each point that burnout increases, uh, we've got a 3 or a 10% increase in the likelihood of that medical error reporting. We've got greater uh, ratings uh, in between physicians, among physicians, who are saying their family life is greatly affected, increases in divorce, increases in depression, um, and significant use of abuse um, in substance abuse themselves. And then just on the basic level, of well, always comes down to the dollar, doesn't it, in many ways, um, when we look at it, there's anywhere from 500000 to a $1 million to replace one physician because of the downstream effect in the system. So again, a lot of places where physician burnout is not just about us worrying about one individual doctor or a group of doctors, it's affecting our entire system. And that's because the system is what's affecting our doctors. This is what I like to just bring to the attention of our administrators when I'm talking to them. Um, because what I will often hear from administrators is, Kathy, we're all on the same page. What's the problem? We're just all trying to take care of the patient. And what I like to explain to them is that from a business perspective, how you identify with the patient is quite different than how a doctor does. I don't want to go through this whole thing, but here's a, a kind of the highlights. That for um, people in administration, the training is very different. And, and so they use a rationalization for what they do. They use efficiency as their models. We are measured constantly now on efficiency measures, not necessarily on outcomes. Um, and there's a different feel to it. And for physicians, they're, they're really, they rely on collegial work um, with all the way that speci specialties are. And they work on expertise. It's not just how fast I can get the job done, but how well can I get the job done. Um, and then there are lots of other things. For administrators making a living, where um, is their work? But for phys physicians, if you think about how long it takes them to become one, their entire life is directed at being who they are professionally. So work is their life. Um, and they will almost always, almost always, 99.9% .9 of the time, even if it doesn't feel like it when you're in their office, they will put patients first. It's amazing to me how when I have physicians come in who are really struggling, and I say to them, we've got to cut out time. They will struggle. No, because I have to be there. Who else is going to do this? Um, it's, a, it's a challenge for them. Down at the bottom is where I, I also, the vocabulary. Um, there's a huge vocabulary difference, and I say this to administrators. When they talk about patient, they'll say, patient satisfaction is what we need. And when I talk to physicians, they say, patient outcome is what we want to look at. That's true, and at the same time when physicians are saying that, I say to them, be careful, because you're right. I know what you mean when you say patient outcome. They want the best outcome from their patient. But we know that medicine is driven by business. And if we go from patient satisfaction to patient outcome, and now we're going to measure our doctors on outcome, think about some of our chronic population, diabetes, um, and some others that need long-term care. If our patients are not can go along with the treatment, What's going to happen? Physicians are going to get dinged if their patients aren't following what they're being recommended to do. So I, I don't see an easy solution. Um, nobody does, but we have to keep having this conversation. And it's ha hard to have a conversation when we have different viewpoints, different worldviews, and different language. So we've got a lot of work to do. There's no doubt that this is a threat. This is a threat to our medical field in terms of us not getting people to want to come into medicine. Most doctors are no longer encouraging their children to go into the field because of how they're being treated in it. Um, and there, we have more people leaving the field earlier than we ever did, early retirement. Often people talking about, I'm just doing this until I can get out of here. Um, it's, so it's a threat. It's a threat to our patients because, again, medical errors go up, um, lack of compassion. And there's nothing worse than being in a very severe medical condition and having a physician who's not connecting with you. It's very difficult. There is no one perfect plan and no one perfect solution. I put this up here because this was a bridge that was built by the world's best engineers. And it was a bridge that was built in Honduras. And it was supposed to withstand any hurricane. As you see, the bridge withstood a hurricane back in 1998, Hurricane Mitch. It withstood the hurricane, and the Darn River moved. 
So I believe that a lot of what we've been doing in med medicine is we're building a lot of these you know, best in service, best in class ideas. And the darn river keeps moving because services keep changing. Um, the advances in medicine are so rapidly changing that we have a difficult time keeping up with it. Um, we have so many specialists now. And the communication between your primary care and every specialist is more complicated. There's no one plan. Uh, but we can look at some things. Uh, one of the things that I absolutely believe in from my experiences now is that we cannot fix this system if we're not taking care of our physicians. I truly believe that. I've come by it from experience with them. I know their um, intentions are good and honorable. And I really believe it's incredibly important for us to begin to find out ways that we can support them. Um, and we can't have a good patient experience until physicians are being treated as well as we'd like everybody else to be treated. So talking in our hospital about filling everybody's bucket, there's a children's book that's about filling a bucket. And it's wonderful about just how you go through your day being present to everybody that you meet, making sure that you are present and positive and hopeful. And so we're, we are talking about that and treating our physicians the same way we want everybody else to be treated. And for a long time, it's been very easy for everyone to stereotype, why, what do the doctors have to complain about? They make a lot of money. They have all these uh, opportunities. It's more complicated than that. Um, certainly, they're making less money. Um, they all come out of school with a, cr a tremendous amount of debt. And if I compare the lifespan developmentally of somebody who becomes a physician and that of almost everybody else's career path, it is significantly different in terms of their ability to have connections and relationships and life experiences. Um, and it does impact them and their families. This is a model that's coming out of Stanford. Um, we've used it now in our um, developing prevention models. There's an idea that there are three domains that will help provide better wellness and better balance for our physicians. One is a culture of wellness, getting them to understand that if they don't take care of themselves, they're of, of value to no one, including themselves, their family, and their patients. Um, an efficiency of practice, looking at what are the things that medicine can do that can change the course of how medicine is being delivered, and then personal resilience. Um, and at Florida Hospital, we've superimposed on that mind, body, spirit. Mind being the practice, the efficiency of practice, how can we do things better? The spirit being the culture, and the body um, actually being the resilience. Can we do this in a way that's better for our physicians? Uh, this is one of the things that we talk about with our doctors is and with the whole system that we work within is, do we know what our value is? Are we actually living what we say we want to be? Are we following our mission? And the two most important days in your life, according to Mark Twain, are the two days, that, the day that you're born and the day you discover your why. So we talk a lot about all of our, to all of our employees at Florida Hospital and now focusing on our physicians about why are you doing what you're doing and is it helping you to have meaning in what you're doing. Um, and it's an important conversation for all of us to have in our work. What helps us get up every morning and go out and do what we have to do? So this is a, a clip about that.
幻术。你靠仔，带宽。What it talks about is he gets what money can't buy, he gets emotion, he gets connection. And so we're talking about that at our hospital a lot and with our physicians a lot about what is it in the moment, staying in the moment, and how can we help with making the system make that possible for you. Um, so the first part is are we doing our values, are we living them out? The second part is are we using time effectively? So what are the efficiencies that we're using? And then this is about talking about we need to use time effectively, technology effectively. It's not a mistake that I have to go outside the United States to find some decent commercials <laughs> um, that have some emotion to them, right? So the idea is really that try to connect for the things that are going to make practice better. How can we do this? And when I work with physicians in counseling and consulting, what I say to them is I'd like a pledge that they will take 15 minutes out of their day where they turn off their phone. And at first, I asked for half an hour. Oh my goodness, that was like asking for them to cut off their arm. Um, so we, we come down with 15 minutes, um, but they're actually extending it after they try it a while, especially those, interestingly enough, that have teenagers because their teenagers started to comment on the fact, because I said, I want you to make a show of it. I want you to turn your phone off, put it on the counter, let your family know you're doing it. And the teenagers started to talk to their parents about turning off their, their phones and being present in a way that they hadn't been before. So I, I think it's just a simple change that's an efficiency change that we can work on. Um, the American Medical Association has a website. This is just for, if you're interested, they have a website that's brand new. American Medical Association has never been that great for doctors, in their opinion, in terms of being supportive. But they're really starting to step up. And they have this Step Forwards program. And they're giving examples of how can you make your practice more efficient. So just as a couple of them, one of the ideas is embedding pharmacists in with the actual uh, physician team. Um, and so I know that in hours, like on, in children's, we have a pharmacist round with our physicians every morning. And when I round with the team, you can see a huge difference when a pharmacist is there in terms of uh, medicine is more and more complicated. And especially in our pediatrics, um, it's really been a very helpful addition. They're also adding pharmacists to primary care in some locations. And Michigan did a study, and they found that um, pharmacists will see up to 12 patients a day in a private, you know, in a primary care setting. 
and they will take the more complicated cases. We have so many physician, uh, patients who are on a uh, cocktail of medications. And so they've really helped reduce the time the, the um, physician is spending looking up medications because the pharmacist is, that's their specialty. So that's one idea of embedding pharmacist. Another, there, these are three other improving processes idea. One is tapping in. So we have our badges, we can tap into our system. Um, that can save anywhere from 17 to 25 minutes a day in getting access to information. Another one is a center of where the, farm, the physician and the nurse and the whole team are working together, not just in the hospital, but in their primary care settings as well. That can save up to 30 minutes a day without having to go back and forth and find information. And then as simple as having a printer in every exam room for printing out prescriptions and printing out um, anything you want the patient to do can save up to 20 minutes a day. These are some of the steps. There are a lot of efficiency steps that we are working with. We have one research study right now where we're putting, because the research is showing that if we have, for every one physician, two MAs, that the physician can spend more time and they can get more done and the patient can be seen for a longer period of time. And so we're doing a research project right now um, in one of our practices, two of our practices, where we are now, instead of having two physicians for one MA, we're flipping it two MAs for one physician and looking at the economic and the efficiency uh, outcomes of those. The other part that I spend most of my time with, with physicians, so the administrative stuff is a piece, so we have a consulting piece in my department. That's the administrative, how can we help? We do lean management kinds of reviews with people. But then on the individual counseling and preventative, we're talking about mindful living. Are, is your mind full of everything you have to do every day, which is what most of us have a mind full of, or have we got what our children had and what we had when we were younger? A mindful brain that notices things. And it doesn't take a whole lot, but it is an important thing. So I'll share a story from one of the, he's my favorite curmudgeon. So he came in because he called me and he said, my colleagues think I need to talk to you. You know, they think that I need some a conversation with somebody who might be a little more positive, and they think you're a positive person. So he came in and he complained. I mean, he just was like, Negative, 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 negative. He obviously had been negative for a very long time. And I asked him to do a very simple thing. A lot of the things that I ask are simple in the beginning. And I said to him, you know, I just want you to go home. And in the next week, I'd like to see you next week. Just want to see what happens if you spend the time looking for things that are positive in your life, anywhere at all in your day. He came back the next week. I said, so how did it go? What did you find? Nothing. There is nothing positive happening. Everything is, I said, you know, I was at your office the other day and you have an ice machine. That's really, that's really nice. Everybody can go get a nice cold drink in your office. And he said, excuse my language, damn thing is broken. I said, oh my goodness. So I said to him, okay, one more time, I want you to just try and do something positive. But I'm gonna give you something very specific. It, there was a, I'm sorry, I'm getting a, oh. Um, there was a um, beautiful tree that I noticed that was in full bloom on my way in this morning. So when you get off of I-4, I want you to notice this absolute beautiful tree. This is last year. So he goes off, he comes back the next week, and I said, so how did it go this week? He said, you won't believe what happened. I said, what happened? He said, I went home and I picked up my wife and I said, we're gonna, and I had suggested, why don't you take your wife out for dinner? Their children were grown. And I said, why don't you take your wife out for dinner? Because he told me they hadn't been out for a long time. They don't do much. He goes home, you know, the negative. Meh. So I said, take your wife out for dinner. So he went home, he picked up his wife. They turned around and as they were coming off the exit to go to the restaurant, he said to her, wow, you know, that tree really is beautiful. And she said, oh my God, you're dying. You're taking me out to dinner to tell me that you're dying. <laughs> he said, Kathy, I was so blown away, shocked. I never realized I was that bad. I, I really am that bad. And so we worked for a while. He's still negative. That's his personality. He still, he still sees the world with a glass half empty, but he's at least aware of it. And his friends are now teasing him a lot. P.S. They cut the tree down in the construction of I-4. Which, of course, he was the first one to point out to me that the tree is gone. What day is it, asked Pooh? It's today, my favorite day. 
I'm really encouraging everyone I work with to stay in the moment. Today is the only day. We can't be predicting. We can't go back. It's a waste of our energy. So for us to try and focus um, what is happening in the present moment um, is so incredibly important, especially when we're working with our patients who are sick. You know, we never see patients at their best. They're, you know, we don't go into the doctor when we feel good. We go in when we're struggling with something. And so to encourage our physicians to remember that, that this becomes routine for them but it's never routine for the person who they're talking to. I think it's stress. So that's what most people come into me and they say, it's stress, I'm just stressed, I'm just stressed. There is a difference between stress and burnout, by the way, but that's complicated. But I do want to mention, there's Stacy McGonigal, who is out of Stanford, is a social psychologist, and she did this wonderful research. She was on the circuit for many years talking about, stress is bad for you, stay away from stress. How do you stay away from stress? Again, if you're alive, you're stressed. Well, she did more research, and there was one research she pro she project she did with 8,000 people. And what she did is she asked them some questions. She asked them how stress affected them. Did you, do you believe stress is good for you, or bad for you, or neutral? That was one question. And then she asked, how much stress do you have? A lot, a little, medium. And then she looked at death records of these 8,000 people years later. And what she found was really interesting. Correlations, no direct, you know, we can't say, oh, this is this. But correlations, which were fascinating to her, the people who said that stress is bad for you and had the lowest perception of their personal stress had the highest death rate. And it continued. The people who thought that stress was very bad for them had high, high stress rate, bad, 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 bad. Um, so the people who felt stress was just a part of life, not necessarily bad for you, but they have high levels of stress, not as high a death rate. So what she comes up with is that stress is not killing us. It's what we think about stress that is killing us. So we do a lot with cognitive behavioral kinds of things in terms of what are you thinking about this? Is this true? Now I work with doctors. They're scientists. They like evidence. So a lot of the times I just say to them, when they say to me, the system's out to get me. Say, so, okay, where is the evidence for that belief? And then we can break it down. And some of the evidence is, yes, the system is broken, but is it directly related to you? Not likely. It's not directly related to you. It is a system problem. And that little shift can make a difference in how they experience their day. I want to share a story that was shared with me when I was very first out in the field and I went to a workshop for a psychologist and we had a motivational speaker. I do not remember anything else about what this person told us that day except for the story, the personal story he shared. And it transformed how I thought, so I like to share it with our doctors and I like to share it with you today. He told about how he was leaving his home one morning and he was running a little bit late and he got to a stop sign, and he was behind someone in a car. And there was traffic coming the other way, and so he couldn't go around easily. There was you know, the four-way stop. Couldn't go around, and he sees there's a lot of activity from the driver, and he's saying, what the heck? And he starts beeping the horn, beeping the horn, and he still sees a lot of activity from the driver. And then the driver opened the door and got out, and he got out of his car, and he's running toward this person. What is wrong with you? Da -da -da. And the person opens the back seat, and he sees in the back seat there's a baby choking. He's able to get the, and the seatbelt wouldn't come out. He's able to get the baby, the whole thing. He gets the baby, the, the baby was choking. He gets the baby, dis, the thing dislodged. Baby's fine, mom is fine. And what he said was, I realized I never know what someone has in the back seat of their car. And I thought, profound thinking, really, that whenever I meet anyone, I do not know what their story is. I'm coming in to a novel in the middle of a chapter, and I have no idea what happened before I met that person. None whatsoever. Unless I ask, unless they're willing to share, all I can do is fill in the blanks. And I just share that story with you because I think it's such a helpful idea that now, I mean, if somebody cuts me off, you know, people have road rage, I could care less. I'm like, well, I hope you don't have a baby in the back seat when you're driving like that. I might even say that out loud. But it's not about me at that point, right? And that helps our doctors sometimes. These are the kinds of tips that we're doing for resiliency building. You don't have to take on everybody else's pain. You have to acknowledge it, but you don't have to take it on. 
One of the tricks that I have our physicians do, and especially I'm doing this with our residents who are always like, because <gasps> they have been told they have to be perfect. All doctors believe they have to be perfect, which of course is not possible. But I ask them to breathe during the day. When you're under stress or you're running from one thing to another, we often hold our breath and we're not even aware of it. So I say to them, I want you to take a deep breath in when you go from one patient to the other. This will give you permission to let the one patient go before you meet the next one. Take a deep breath in and think, hello moment, as you breathe out, I am here. And they're doing it. Um, they're actually talking about how that does help just slow them down a little bit. It takes away some of that stress. And at the end of the day, they're not quite as tired because they're not like this the entire day. Now this came um, when I, again, was in training. I started in trauma and uh, with people who had someone in their family murdered and then an emergency room, the one who delivered the bad news all the time. And so one of um, my mentors said to me, you know, when you, when you really have had it in between people, just kind of go like this. <laughs> OK. So one day I came out. It had been a horrific morning. I came out, and we had offices lined up in a hallway. And I just came out, and the person had left. And nobody was in the hallway. And I just went, oh. And I looked down. And at the very end of the hallway was one of my male colleagues. And he's out there going, oh. <laughs> And the two of us just went like this, oh, man. you know, See you at lunch. Um, and it was just, it, but it, it was a light moment. Again, what are we doing to take care of ourselves in little ways? These are little things that can build resiliency and help us get through these very stressful times. And everybody ha who, anybody who's alive is stressed. Anybody who's working is stressed. If you have children, you're stressed. There's stress. How are we dealing with it? Um, one of the last things, the, a story, actually, I want to end on a story, which is this is my absolute mem most memorable place from Florida Hospital. So I had a young man uh, come and call me one day, and he said, Dr. Gibney, I've been told by my colleagues I really need to see you, and they suggest I need to see you today. And I said, all right. This was last summer. I said, all right, um, I'm done around 7. Come over to the office. So he came in, and he proceeded to sit down on the chair in my office and sob, sobbing the kind of crying that where you get the hiccups, and you can't breathe, and you can't talk, and you go on like this. And he started, and he's crying, crying. And finally, he says, I can't, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And he was so emotional and just, I can't do this. And I let him cry for a while. And then I said to him, tell me what's going on. Just please tell me what's happening. And he said, this is my life now. He was only three years out of his fellowship. And he said, I get into the hospital by 6. I work all day. I'm taking care of people all day. I come home, I have th two small children and my wife. I don't get home until 7, 8 o'clock at night. And I walk in the house. My wife is fantastic. She has dinner made, saved for me. The children are ready for bed. They're in their jammies. I flop on the couch. The kids climb all over me for a few minutes. I don't even, can't even tell you what's on television. Sometimes I eat the dinner she gives me. Sometimes I don't. She mostly puts the kids to bed. I go to bed, I get up, I do the same thing the next day. I'm doing this six, seven days a week. I can't do it. We talked some more, and then I said to him, I want you to do one thing for me. Now, the doctors now know me. I've been there five years. They know that I kind of do, again, simple things. Um, but they roll their eyes a lot when I tell them that I want them to try something simple. So I said to him, and I just want you to go home and take a shower. And he looked, he said, Kathy, I, I, I said, just go home, take a shower, and I want to see you in three days. Two days later, I get a phone call from him. And he says, Kathy, can I see you this afternoon? And I said, I have a half an hour at noon. You want to come? Came over. He sat down. He said, I, I couldn't even wait till tomorrow to tell you what happened. I said, what happened? He said, I went home. I took a shower. And I put on shorts and a t-shirt. And I came out. And my six-year-old daughter was there. And I said to her, you know, let's go for a walk around the block. She said, can I take my new flashlight? And it was just getting dark. They walked around the block. And he said to me, I promise you, it's, we don't have a big block. We walked around the block. She had her little flashlight. We talked a little bit about how the day went. We came in. I saw my four-year-old son sitting there. And he's looking at me like, how oh, come I didn't get to go? So I said to him, come on, buddy. Let's go out in the yard. Can I take her flashlight? He took the flashlight. We went out five minutes, no more, I promise you, Kathy, picking up sticks and stones in our backyard, piling them up, coming back in the house. He said, I felt a little bit better, and no big deal. I felt a little bit better. I'm kind of thinking, you know, maybe the shower helped. Um, I 
didn't really eat. I didn't really help put the kids to bed other than I you know, kissed them goodnight and thanked my wife, and I went to bed. That's not what I want to tell you. I want to tell you what happened last night when I came home. He said, as I walked in the side door of our house, my six-year-old daughter came running toward me. Daddy, 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 will you be the daddy you were last night? He starts crying. I start crying. And he said, Kathy, you have to help me be that daddy. And I said, Joe, the beauty of this is that you are that daddy. She saw that daddy. You just need to be that daddy with intention. And you just need to be that daddy more often. I don't need to teach you to be that daddy. But I can be the one to help you pull out that daddy. He's doing really well. Um, he doesn't work the hours he did. We have figured out a lot of things together. I got a thank you note from his wife. That's why it's my favorite story. I mean, I can still get goosebumps when I think about that man and what he was doing. And the reason I asked him to take a shower is because I'm a firm believer in transitions. When we're going from one part of our life to another, it's important to be conscious of how we're transitioning. Take that white medical jacket off and become the daddy, the husband, the friend, the son, the grandson. And you're not the doctor at home. It's so hard for our physicians to do that because they've been the doctor in every area of their life for so long. It's really hard. It's for all of us, though. <coughs> Um, when I transition from work to home, I never have the radio on in my car. And I will often laugh by myself, so I'll tell you one last little joke story kind of thing. I was coming home last summer, and it had been a rough day. So I'm in my car, windows down. It was spring, windows down, and I'm laughing all by myself. <laughs> and, I'm, and it's a red light, and I'm just in there, <laughs> and I'm laughing. Guy comes up in a pickup truck next to me, and he sees it. I'm like, now I'm really laughing. <laughs> you know, he rolls down his window, and he said to me, "Hey, lady, what radio station are you listening to?" And I said, "I don't have the radio on." Whoop goes the window, <laughs> and he's like, "Whoa!" Looked at me. But it's helpful. What are the transition points in your life? Transition between patient to patient, between client to client, between child to child, whatever. How are you moving from one person, one event to the next, that you're not carrying the bad stuff with you to the next person? I tell the physicians, you know, when we go into a patient's room where they've had Dr. Google experience, and their patient, the family is there, and they're telling you what you should be doing because they looked it up on Dr. Google. And so they're telling you. And the physicians get so emotionally attached to that. Like, they feel like they have to defend themselves. Say, just, it's OK. Their family is trying to take care of them. Tell them, thank you. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're wondering that. We will look into that. That's all you have to do. And then when you leave the room, shake it off before you go into the next room, because they don't deserve to have what's left over from the Dr. Google family. They haven't been to Dr. Google. So those are all the little vignettes that I think build resiliency, that help bring our doctors along while we're trying to fix the system. They're little things. I don't claim that they're going to make or fix anything major. But I think that they can help us while we try to get to the place where we need to get systemically. And I want to end with an Irish blessing. I am from a, a very Irish family. And um, <clears throat> I just came across this, and I just think it speaks beautifully to what I'm hoping for everybody um, as they go through the transitions in life. <clears throat> I wish you not a path devoid of clouds, nor a life on a bed of roses, nor that you might never need regret, nor that you should never feel pain. No, that is not what I want for you. My wish for you is that you might be brave in times of trial when others lay crosses upon your shoulders, when mountains must be climbed and chasms are to be crossed, when hope scarce can shine through, that every gift God gave you might grow along with you, and let you give the gift of joy to all who care for you, that you may always have a friend who is worth that name, who you can trust, and who helps you in times of sadness, who will defy the storms of daily life at your side. One more wish I have for you, that in every hour of joy and pain, you may feel God close to you. That is my wish for you and all who care for you. That is my hope for you now and in every moment. Thank you. Shall I come?
Yes, for those that have questions, wait till I get to the mic to you so that we can ensure that it's on the video. But what a great presentation. Yes, it was very good. Um, I don't know if it was burnout or not. My primary committed suicide over 20 years ago. Um, what I'm curious about from a psychological point of view is if you're that far along, why don't they just, instead of killing themselves, why don't they just quit? Well, suicide is extremely complicated, and that's why I, I'm careful about not connecting burnout directly with suicide because um, it's a wonderful question. Um, suicide would be, we could spend the whole day on that, and um, I don't have an easy answer for that. It becomes a way of thinking um, that there is no other choice, um, and so quitting doesn't become a choice to them because it won't answer all their questions. Because usually when somebody gets to be at a suicidal level, it's at a point where they really believe they have no other options. And in, in my work with people when they're suicidal is for, for me to acknowledge to them that every person, everyone, actually has a choice whether or not they commit suicide or not. Some people, it never enters their mind, but everyone walking the face of the earth can take their own life. What my hope is that I can take somebody who has decided that that's their only option and move it to the very bottom of the list by helping them see what social supports are available or what they can do for them, their own welfare. For physicians, they have a lot of complicated things because um, it's hard to go get ask for help because of stigma, even though they should know better. Um, it can affect your license in some states, Florida being one of them, if you have certain amounts of treatment. Um, can affect your practice. If it's regarding your family, they feel as though they have no option if they, they have no support from their family. It's very complicated. I'm sorry I don't have a better answer. Um, and I am sorry for your loss, because that is a very difficult thing for a partner to live through. So thanks for the question. Any, oh. Hi, Kathy. Connie Rollberg. It's nice to meet you, apart Hi, from nice the emails. To meet you. So um, I wanted to go back to what you were saying about these were little things. You yes. don't know if it made a big difference. But I just did a quick calculation. Even the little reference you gave on 20 minutes a day being saved by putting the printers in each room, that's 20 minutes a day times five days of practice work. That's 100 minutes times 52 weeks. That's 5,200 minutes divided by 60 minutes per hour, that's 86.66 .66 hours or 3.6 days a year. So if you think about that giving you back the free time, my, my thought is don't just fill it up with something else. I know my friends in Morov know that I put on my calendar family and friends days and those are non-negotiable times mm -hmm. and I build my work around that. Because going to the beach with your kid for one day, taking them to Disney, spending quiet time at home, that does renew your soul, yes, it does. your mind, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the little things add up, but it, it's what you do with them. Thank you so much. And I am making a new slide <laughs> with that <laughs> mathematics on it. And I am definitely going to thank you. I am going to use that absolutely in my work. Thank you so much. And you're absolutely right. And that is what happens. The physicians will say that, that they see what they've lost. We have to do a grief period, actually, when they realize how much time they've lost with their families. They have to grieve um, and then start moving forward on what it means when you can do it. I'm not going to stand up so I don't block the photo. But okay. um, the Institute for Health Improvement, we just finished a course with them. And they talked about the husband and wife physician couple out at Stanford yes. who started this uh, medical assistance program that you mentioned. Yes, and Sisin I just, Sisinski. Yes, yes. And I just thought the, the concept is more than just adding MAs to the office. It was actually recognizing that the MAs could be the primary contact for those patients. And correct me if I'm wrong, no, all the right. way through the process. Yes. And indeed, they meet the patients, they help to schedule the appointments, they do everything. So instead of being just an add-on, they become a primary component. And interestingly enough, in what we heard was that the experience to the patients has improved as well, as well as giving the physicians back their lives. So I think it's a wonderful opportunity. I'm glad to hear you're testing it. Yes, and thank you for, for adding that in, because that's exactly right. Um, there's so many things that you know, we can expand on and say, and so that was beautifully said, perfect. Yes, that's exactly what they're doing, and um, they're doing, they are having success with it, so it's lovely. Thank you. Martin, you have a question? 
I do. Thank you for the presentation. Um, as in, in my late teens, we actually lost our family doctor to suicide. I don't know what the circumstances were, but obviously that's one of those very regrettable things. Um, I'm wondering whether you are seeing or have seen any difference um, between the stresses and strains on somebody who is an independent physician, perhaps a solo practitioner, and somebody who has joined a hospital as a physician? Excellent question, and there's some research about that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of their involvement, um, engagement with the healthcare organizations and their satisfaction, they're pretty even. Um, but in terms of the stress, the ones who are in private practice, depending on the type and depending on how it's built, they will say that there's more stress, especially now with all of the federal regulations that are being required for billing purposes and for everything, medical records. Um, so some of the private practice are under a lot more stress expense-wise. Just think about the electronic medical record and how they have to have certain ones and they have to have all of these things built in. So they are financially much more stressed. However, they'll stay there because they ha still have autonomy. What the ones who will join, like our hospital, we have employed and we have contracted and the employed physicians will give up autonomy and so that's a huge piece for those that are not ready to do it so it's it's on a case-by-case -case basis um, but there are some things that we are seeing that if they decide to go to the hospital as employed and they've really done the work on why they're making that decision it works if they go because they're running away from the stress that doesn't work as well thanks for the question Okay, another question. Thank you for such a lovely presentation. My name is Daniel Sherman. I'm representing AdCorp Chiropractic and Rehabilitation. My question to you is, um, how do you communicate to uh, potential staff members that they don't have to be perfect, but still keep intact mm -hmm. the high ethical standard that comes with the medical practice? Uh, wonderful question, Daniel. I get that. I get that in my head a lot of the time. You know, how do we say you have to have excellence? You always have to be providing the best. Um, and there's a book, I don't know if some of you have seen it, When Breath Becomes Air. It's, it's a book written by a young man who had just finished his neurosurgery um, fellowship when he was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor. And he wrote this beautiful book. And in it, um, one part of it, he talks about how when he was in uh, practice, um, his best friend in residency committed suicide. And he writes in this one paragraph where he says, we had taken on an onerous yoke, that of trying to be perfect. It is not possible to be perfect. And he goes on much better eloquently stated than I can. But that we can always strive for it. But we cannot ever attain perfection. No one can. So I often have physicians read that book, and we talk about some of those things. And um, I think there is a difference. We can be striving for excellence and best in class, best of everything. But we have to also know that we're human, and that we are not going to reach perfection, but we can certainly reach our highest potential um, if we're always striving for it. And I think that we need to know that we can't have that perfection, um, because otherwise, when we do make a mistake, it could really be a, a reason for people to feel they have no other choice but to end their life because they've completely destroyed something that they thought had to be a certain way. So we talk about excellence, and we talk about um, striving for your best self, and we talk about the fact that you are human. As we continue to evolve, though, as a society, <clears throat> and we see robotics now coming yes. to replace a lot of the positions that humans are, are in at this time, how do you, again, stress the fact that you don't have to be perfect, but we're competing against these robots? <laughs> well, the robots are only as good as the person driving the robot so far. So, so um, we don't have that dilemma yet. But I can see in the future there will be a moral dilemma at some point. Um, we're not there. Right now, I mean, I do go into the operating room to just observe and see how our physicians are doing, in the special, just at their request, and to work with residents. And I can see a very different you know, you have two surgeons, they'll both be using a robot, and they have totally different styles of doing it. So there's very much a human component still attached. So, but I, I love the question, and I don't have a better answer. But thank you, Daniel. Thank you. I think that's all the questions. What a wonderful thank presentation. You. Another round of applause. Thank you.